I'm going to call this meeting to order. This is our public safety committee meeting. I'm doing it because Bill Evans is out of town, so you got to vote for me today. Uh, let's go around the room and identify ourselves for the record. Pete, we'll start with you. Pete Peterson. Joseph Forrest Dunbar. Tim Stewart. Amy Zabosky. Toby Bridges. Dick Training. Jack Frost. Uh, Dennis LeBlanc. Rob Pitch. Dave Cook. Chris Tolley. Norm Morris, Mayor's Office. Okay. Well, welcome to the meeting. We'll get started with it. Let's see, Chief Tully, you're first. Yes, sir. Uh, I, I know we reached out to clarify the, what we're going to do about the dashboard, and we're going to do that quarterly. And um, I, I can tell you what our staffing levels are right now. Because I'm, that's okay. probably the, most, uh, the biggest concern. Right now, our sworn personnel are at 387, and they're non sworn at 145 for a total of 532. So we haven't been losing a lot of individuals due to retirements and things like that or injuries, which is a good thing. Uh, we are looking at bringing on several of our laterals, uh, and hopefully that'll be done either this month or next month uh, as we finish up the paperwork on that. We'll pick up another three or four in that area, as well as recruitment is going well for the fall academy. Uh, we, we hope to have that as a full academy, and that will be a real change uh, in the staff of those. As we all know, it takes about a year and a half for the department to uh, go through the recruitment process, get a person through the academy, and they get it through the field training aspect. And uh, just this week, two of our laterals that we had uh, from May finished up with their field training, and they actually go solo this week. So that's a huge plus. Question, Ms. Amy Mears. Yes, Amy. Uh, thank you. Um, Chief, I'm going to hit you with a couple different questions. Some I think you'll have to come back with. Um, the, the first question, you can just off the cuff, I don't expect too much explanation, um, but obviously the homicide unit has been very busy in the last uh, week. What can you tell us about um, um, how they're dealing with the, these events? Are they related? Are they not? Can you say that? It's okay if you can't. And uh, otherwise, have you noticed the restraints within the homicide unit? Do you have enough uh, detectives there to, to adequately address the number of homicides you've seen thus far? Yes. Uh, getting daily and not several times a day, updates on each one of these investigations. Uh, we are making pros progress with that. Uh, however, you know, we can make sure they're thorough and, and, and complete. Uh, it'd be premature to make any kind of public statements uh, about if cases are related or not or uh, exactly the status of those cases. Uh, it is definitely uh, demanding of the homicide unit, but we have a large detective division and we call on other units within the detective division to assist with some of that workload. So there's a little bit of cost over there? Yes. Um, can you just tell me, just for my memory, how many officers do we have um, right now that have been actively working in the North Muldoon, Chiyaki, Goldberg area routinely? I'd have to pull those numbers for you. So you're, you're interested in yeah, the Northern Anchorage, how many officers were routinely having work in those areas. The only reason I ask is because I've been getting a, a few more um, contacts with people uh, a little bit more concerned about ever since they're hearing more and more homicides and things. People are, are, are just reaching out to me and asking me, well, how, what kind of coverage do we really have? And typically, my answer is between three and five officers, usually, is what I think, what I think is the right answer, what I've been told in the past. I just want to make sure... Um, like I said, that we're adequately. Um, yes, we have been pumping those staffing le le levels, but we base a lot of our staffing resources needs based on police science. We looked at time of day, days of week, the location of incidents, and we will then deploy specialized units such as our CAP team, even traffic in the in that enforcement unit. We put them into those areas because we know by that presence we, we come up with uh, other information and able to help address those areas that are a little more challenging in the time. Sure, I appreciate that. The other thing that I think you'll probably have to come back with us on, um, and I don't know if it's going to come from you or the Department of Law, um, but as SB91 is now law and it's being implemented, we know that there are a number of previously classified felonies that are reclassified to misdemeanors. I want to be a way in Anchorage to be able to track those. So even though they're not called classified felonies anymore, we know, you know, Whatever that crime was previously, we know it's still the same thing. I mean, people aren't changing their behavior because we're calling it something different. I want to be able to track it over time to see really what impact that is having within our municipality. Is crime going up? Is crime going down? And I, it's going to be hard because obviously they're classifying them differently. So um, if you can kind of give us a rundown of what those felonies were that were reclassified, I know I have it somewhere, but. Yes. 
Seneca is the uh, administration's point person on this. She's out of town this week. Uh, I know there's other staff in her office, but um, it's the public safety yeah. committee meeting will get Seneca to join us and, and, and do something. That would be wonderful. Thank you very much. And um, for now, that's all I have to do. You have a question for the member of the chief? one question for you. We used to have a gang unit in Anchorage. It was one person at one time. Then Chief Mew got rid of his budget cutbacks. Are we going to reinstate the gang unit in the near future? So because I've had other chiefs of police tell me we don't have gangs in Anchorage. We have wannabes. We've got gangs in Anchorage. My question to you is, are we going to reconstitute <coughs> the gang unit? Yes. Uh, right now, I am looking at the 2017 budget evaluating the possibility of staffing a good intelligence unit within the department, and certainly the tracking and monitoring of any gang information would be uh, an important function of that unit right now. Okay. Let me know, will you, when you start to build your budget so I can track its process through an appropriation, because I want to make sure our gang unit is back up to strength. Because I remember talking to people, the guy being the gang unit, he knew all the gangs by name, knew the people that played that, we want to make sure it's the easiest way to try and get a handle on what's happening out there. We've got the gang unit identified. We will do that. Thank you, Chief. Any other questions, any members? And then I think you, on the agenda, you wanted to know about the latest on the 911 calls. Yes, sir. For IP, if you'd like to address those. Go ahead, sir. So the latest 911 stats show 88% of our 911 calls are made from cellular telephones rather than landlines. And the number of landlines that use voice over IP or a small fraction, particularly from out-of-state uh, companies, it's fairly low, anywhere from one and a half percent down to a half percent. Uh, nevertheless, uh, you know, we did identify the local company's work, and they are working with ACS and GCI in an attempt to resolve the issue. I brought along with me Captain Dave Cook, who oversees our administrative uh, division within the department. You might have any kind of technical questions or you'd like additional insight about the issue because there is a lot of history. It's something we've been addressing for years and so on. Any questions? No. For me? Chief Cook, you want to let us know how it's going? Sure. Uh, we right. want to make sure you know the 911 calls coming in are responded to. So. The 911 calls that come into my center are responded to. The problem with the voice over internet protocol, they don't actually come into the 911 center. They come in through the business line and go into the business queue, which is what delays the response. And, and we are, the company is working with ACS and GCI trying to resolve the issue to where they have a gateway that comes into the primary uh, public safety answering point, And they believe that they can resolve it and they are actively moving towards it. <coughs> but at present, the, the lines do still go to a business line and going to keep. This really isn't anything to do with it. We first started identifying it in 2007, and it, when companies start, started uh, providing this service and the calls weren't coming into 911, that it is odd that two occurred within one weekend, which is quite frightening. Yeah. But statistically, it is very, very low the chance of it. Any questions? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So, the last meeting, the conversation was um, the whole, that the 911 issue was with hotels. Okay, and so now I think I'm hearing something different. Um, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm hearing that like there's an issue with any 911 call made from a cell phone. Oh, no, ma'am. Oh, okay. No, no, That's no. I'm sorry I gave you that impression. Yeah. The, the issue is with uh, businesses that purchase phone systems that go through the internet, voice over internet protocol, and company, a particular company that was identified that brought this problem forward is in Canada. They actually answer as a 911 service, then they, after obtaining all the information, route it to either APD or AFD, but on the business line, so it doesn't reach our 911 operators, and it stays in the loop of the non-emergency calls while 911 is answered. And so that caused the delay. Thank you. And that part I understand because that's what we said at the last meeting. Okay. But um, just for clarification, what's the relationship with the hotel? Because the issue before was that it was the hotels that were having this issue. Yes, ma'am. The, the two that were immediately identified were hotels 
um, where they have medical emergencies and we're calling 911 seeking assistance. Um, I think the issue with the hotel is by purchasing a, a out of state company and not paying the 911 surcharge on every phone that you have within the hotel, it's a great savings. Um, and so that's, I think that's the, the um, desire to purchase this system. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Bowser. Thank you. Um, to follow up, um, I have two questions. First one is on Ms. Gray Jackson's question. Um, previously, when we were talking about the hotels, my recollection is we had identified the issue with specifically two hotels. I'm not asking you to name them, but has he talked about how to do it? Well, at least talk to their general managers. Has APD done that? Or do you have a plan to do that? Well, what was our resolution there? The immediate resolution is the company providing the service has talked to their customers, advised them of the problem, and they are working with ACS and GCI trying to obtain a gateway into 911 and to resolve the issue for it. It will not be an issue. If they're unable to do that, then the chief and I are in discussion just the next step of how to handle them. Yeah, that, that's an adequate answer for me. I appreciate that. I see proactive movement. I like that. Yeah. Uh, the second question I have. When we're talking specifically about this company, the 911 calls are going, let's just say, to Canada. So they go to their call center, they take the information. The way our system runs is all 911 calls come into APD and get, then get, they take the information and then they get transferred to AFD. So you, what you're saying is that is not happening. So they take it and then they decide does it go to AFD or APD? Or does it still go to APD? Because now I'm seeing Basically, we're playing hopscotch, and already people are furious when they get the second operator. And then, Lord help us if it goes out to CDFD, you know. So, I mean, how many times are we really transferring these people? I'm not sure that I can adequately answer that. The two, the two instances that I'm aware of, roughly three weeks ago, they were actually transferred into APD's line. I am told that it can be transferred into AFD's business line again. But again, that doesn't get you into the emergency operations center. Sure. Um, so either way, you, you're absolutely correct. We're frustrating citizens, yeah. transferring them, putting them on hold. You shouldn't be on hold when you're on 911. Well, you again, and I think uh, obviously some of us recognize how the system works. So I think it's very helpful for us to have this conversation and for us to be all on the same page that three steps to get to the emergency responders, especially if it's paramedic, is not really <coughs> So it sounds like you guys are making good steps to rectify that situation. So yes, we are more working on it. Thank you. We've been joined by Mr. Wiggleton. Welcome, sir. And there's pizza in the back if you want. Any questions for the chief of police? Okay. Another question to semi American. Okay, we'll move on then. Thank you, Chief. Thank you. Mr. Frost, you're next, I think. Good morning. This is our um, first attempt for a dashboard for code enforcement. <coughs> and it will evolve soon, I'm sure. What uh, you have before you is actually our performance measures that we track monthly and then quarterly, and it speaks more to the quantity, the frequency, and the response times uh, based on our metrics that we use to, uh, to gauge our effectiveness and efficiencies. What I hope to get to soon is that we can report the uh, types of complaints and by community council, how, how many we have, what type of the complaints, that where it where community helpful. council. And it's in the uh, in the Infor public sector, we have some draft reports written, our, our uh, consultants have written some reports. Uh, they're just almost ready for testing now. We just got notified uh, late last night that they're ready for testing. And so right now it'd be a, it, it's a data mining, <coughs> I won't say nightmare, but it's really labor intensive to uh, pull them out like that. I can't do it, but it's uh, hopefully these new reports will be able just to to run a report and have that for, for anybody that needs them. So, Good. but anything you see, if you, any item that you'd like to see that you think would be useful, please let me know and we'll make it happen. Thank you, Pat. Question, Ms. Emily members? Mr. Mousy. Thanks. Um, Jack, just off the top of my head, I can't remember, how many code enforcement officers do you currently have today? Eight now in land use enforcement. We just hired our, thanks to the assembly, the. Uh, Eighth to help with the uh, marijuana inspections. Sure. Are you noticing one particular uh, portion of town, geographically speaking, that has the highest density of calls that you're tied up in? There. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> we don't. We don't call them all. <laughs> 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 you do it yourself, right? <laughs> no, there's really there. 
you know, we, we can find pockets, but it's, it's throughout the municipality. Most of our complaints now are, are, uh, are garbage and housing type complaints. <coughs> Last question. It kind of borders on uh, Mr. Um, Peterson and, and um, Shugiak and East Anchorage. Let's just put that in two assembly districts. There's a, a trailer park right off of Muldoon. Do you, are you familiar with where I'm talking about? Um, are you working on the highway out? Yeah, they're over there. But I've, I've actually received a, a number of calls. I keep directing people to code enforcement over there, but I've received a number of calls <coughs> um, from that, um, that um, I can't remember the name of it. There are several. Yeah, it's right off of the first one, right near uh, the subway. We go up that road, yeah. right off the highway. Um, I'm just having a, a mind for these right now. But that particular one, I've had two or three people that I directed to code enforcement because they're complaining about excessive trash and the owner's not basically making people clean up their stuff. Way too many cars, that kind of stuff. Have you noticed any increase in that particular area? I'm not aware of any, but I'll, I'll check. That'd be helpful, just because, like I said, it's kind of one of those areas that's kind of between us, and I just always refer people to code enforcement, and I just don't know if they followed through, but I have received probably in the last two weeks three calls, so. If they make the complaint, that gets us in the door, and then, as you know, then we deal with the, with the uh, park owner. Sure. But we have to have a if reason, you know reason to go first. in first, Jerry. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, thank you. Mr. Wilson, Chair. So a, a number of complaints could, um, that be, could you have 10 complaints for one problem? They would show up as 10? Is this by issue? They would they would show up as ten, but just then, then the resolution code would change. We'd have duplicate complaints, or they, they one would show up as valid, the other nine would show as duplicates. But we Regardless, it's the same amount of efforts in, is involved initially to, to uh, make the determination if it's a valid complaint or not. Okay, thanks. Is that all, John? Yeah, thanks. I have a question. Yes, sir. So, so thus far, we don't have any. Well, I guess that we you might have one now. Marijuana business. Um, when does that new code enforcement officer come? Is he already working or she already working? She's for in you? training at this point. Great. We're going to cross train across the uh, spectrum of our officers. So. That was going to be my, my question. So, you know, there, there's a possibility that this code enforcement officer will be consumed by marijuana issues, but so far it seems like there's a relatively small number of these businesses relative to the number of alcohol businesses we have, for example, or it's just the number of calls we get regarding trash and that kind of thing. Is that code enforcement officer going to be able to be used in other ways if the marijuana industry doesn't consume all of their time? Absolutely. What, what, what we do is we cross train all of our officers across the entire spectrum. So we always have somebody to be able to, to plug them wherever we need them. It gives more flexibility and, help, and it helps the community as well. Wilton, sir. Question, if someone files a complaint and you investigate, because this says 100% of both of these within a day, so you're getting out there really quick, does a person who complains get notified that, hey, we need to pull up and what the result is? If, there's a, if they make a complaint online, using one of the, there's a, uh, a box they can select if they want to be contacted by a telephone, email, or in person. And, um, and just to explain, the way we've established our workflow is and on the very back page you'll see an actual uh, explanation of, of definitions of of, um, of terms. We track the first time, the first time that we've actually physically done something with the complaint, whether it's doing an <coughs> initial analysis, whether you've reached out and contacted someone, whatever that is. That and, and we've set it up. Hopefully, we'll never go be, below 100 percent because there's always a, a, a redundancy in the system so that someone's taking a look at it. And when a, when a citizen or someone makes a complaint online, it immediately pops up on our computer. As soon as you hit send, it's, we've got it on our dashboard so we can start work on it. So have you ever heard, oh, they never come, they never do anything? Never. <laughs> yeah. Sure, absolutely. So and I most of the time when we hear that, it's, um, for an example, would be my neighbor has uh, seven junk cars in her yard. It hasn't moved for two years. Well, they may not be junk cars and nothing's been done. Well, it's, if it doesn't meet the code definition of what a violation is, and a lot of times their perception is that, that nothing's been done. So would they be told that? Would your, they sure. complain oh, yes. and you go back and say, hey, it's, not, it's unpleasant, but not a code violation? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Good, thank you. Yes, of course. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have uh, two quick questions. The first, just going off what Mr. Wells just said about junk cars, we get a lot of calls for junk cars on our side of town, too. and. Um, 
I, I think that your officers have correctly identified them. These aren't junk cars by the strict legal definition, but you know, they still upset our neighbors. I'm curious about though is, are they updating the registration, the tag on these cars? And if they're not, are you able to enforce that? Or does someone else have to be notified to say, you know, yes, you've got, these aren't technically junk cars, but you've got six of them, none of them have been registered, registered since 2009, for example. And that's a way that we could perhaps have some enforcement. Is that you guys or is that someone else? We don't deal with that. That's one of the elements of the definition in Title 15 is unregistered and then missing body parts, broken glass, et cetera. But we, we don't address the registration. So who just, would Except just to, just to make mental note of it in, in, in the overall assessment. Is there some way that we could, who, so who does do the enforcement for the registration? It would have to come to the, uh, if, if the vehicles were on the street, maybe APD would see them or something. Is there some way we could develop when you guys go out there and inspect all these cars and you're like, well, they're not, they're not the, you know, they're not junk cars, the windows aren't broken, whatever. But we can see that none of these are registered. Is there some way that you could report that to whomever should go and collect the fines for registration? So if they're parked and they're never driven, then they don't have to be registered. Is that right? I, I don't believe that. Things only if they're operating, yeah. they if they're they're operating on the streets. What's that? I think only if they're on the roadway. So I don't know for sure. I'd have to defer to the APD. So the argument is these aren't junk cars, but they never, but they never operate on the roadways. <coughs> is this? <laughs> these are these dangers are not museum pieces. Well, just my experience. Is, my experience is, is going back to. Uh, Proposition three, I think it was 1997 before when we had the when we had the parking authority that did exactly as you're talking about and go through parking lots, private property, etc. And Prop three took all that away because it became in, in the public's view heavy-handed. So, of course, under Greg Meistrom, we had something called rest rest in peace. Mm -hmm. They would actually come to your yard and if the cars are registered, they would tow them away. Well, I'm not. They don't do that anymore. Yeah, I'm not advocating that. Right. But but I'm, I'm saying I, I I thought that you had to be registered if you were in the municipality. I didn't realize you had to be actually driving. It. But it is an interesting catch twenty two. The argument of these owners is these are not junk, but I'm never never driving them on the streets. Right. I know I was one to look at one yesterday. There's a house I'm calling by. It has ten cars. Yeah. And they've not been driven in years. But to the person that owns them, they're classics. They want to say, well, they're not registered. But we don't have a way to deal with that. Wish we did. Well, the one, the one tool we have is that the uh, accessory use has to be less than fifty percent of the principal use. So if you have a twenty-five hundred square foot house, we can go back and say you can only have a uh, twelve hundred fifty feet of storage if there, if it, if items are in storage. It's kind of tough, but the zoning board made that uh, ruling. It uh, was appealed to the Supreme Court, and they upheld it. So it's it's, it's a tool, but it's a stretch. And that was that was a, kind of the intent of the ordinance that uh, Mr. Hall came forward with about storage in front yards and those types of things, just to address this. And we know how well that went. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so my, my second question is on the again on the marijuana enforcement. This question came up in our um, community economic development uh, committee yesterday. So usually HHS, my understanding is usually HHS does odor enforcement. Is that right? That is. But who are going to have the marijuana enforcement officer? So who is going to do the checking on the odor? We're having meetings on that next week to, to dial it down into the specific departments and responsibilities. Okay. And Jack, there is a machine out there, an odor measure, to take the human element out. They call it it. I've heard of that. I've heard of it. It would be interesting to make sure we have that device available so we don't get in the problem of one person saying I can smell it and another one saying it doesn't sure. exist. Anything else in the city members? Thank you for all your work. Thank you. I say, Fire Chief, Chief Malone, how are you, sir? I'm great, thank you. Uh, you should have the uh, one page agenda, but not agenda, but the <coughs> dashboard for the public safety meeting. Uh, my apologies on the top row that describes incidents by type and month. If you go over to the last column, year to date percent, uh, should have caught that, but those were grossly inaccurate. If you have a pencil, I can give you the correct numbers, or I'll just send out another one. But uh, the correct numbers are, if you go down, it's 3%, 0, 69%, 0, 6, 16, 6, and 0, 0. 
and I'll, I'll correct those and send those out to you, but uh, that's a pretty static number, but it does show that almost 70% of what we do continues to be medicine. Uh, and, and that's an interesting uh, segue into, if there are no other questions on the dashboard, that stays pretty static. Uh, so what I try to do is I'll try to introduce an interesting topic. Of course, last, week, last month we talked about uh, the need for increased staffing and dispatch. But of course, the, the, the big news over the past month with the Anchorage Fire Department, with the Anchorage Hillside, uh, the state forestry folks was the McHugh Creek fire. Uh, there was a little bit of public misconception about how that was handled early on. So I wanted to do very, very briefly and give, give you a, a quick timeline. And I put together a 12-page uh, uh, historical look at that fire, if anybody is interested. In, it's, it's just a combination of all of the Anchorage Fire Department and Division of Forestry uh, updates. And it's pretty interesting. But as you know, that fire was first reported to us uh, Saturday night uh, on the 16th of July, about 11.30. Uh, McHugh Creek, so uh, Engine 9 was dispatched out of the Huffman Station. Uh, they arrived on location, confirmed that there was a plume of white smoke, uh, pulled up into the McHugh Creek parking lot, and uh, were aided by another uh, unit from AFD, and, and three of our folks uh, started up the trail to see if they could find the seat of the fire. Of course, this is around midnight, 12:15 uh, a.m. on Sunday morning. And after walking about a half a mile, three quarters of a mile, they realized that uh, the terrain was too steep. It's dark, it's bare country. Uh, they couldn't get to the seat of the fire. They immediately called uh, for DOF, Division of Forestry, assets. There were no DOF crews on duty that night. Uh, and the first helipack uh, couldn't commence until 10 a.m. in the morning. Uh, so we called state parks and that uh, uh, of 12.43 a.m., we uh, terminated our involvement with that particular fire, returned to station, and then on Sunday morning, uh, DOF uh, arrived. Uh, they confirmed that there was a fire, about 25 acres at the time. Uh, they had two helicopters in response at 10 a.m., as well as an air tanker uh, with retardant. And through Sunday and Monday, you may recall the interviews with the uh, with the firefighters from the Division of Forestry, uh, they were very confident, they had high optimism. The winds were blowing favorably, uh, the fire is in a rugged uh, area of the Chugach, but it's, uh, you know, the duff is not very thick there because there's not a tremendous amount of vegetation. If you think of those California forest fires, nothing like that at all. And uh, dropping water with the, uh, the two helicopters, they felt pretty good about it. Actually then on Monday night, uh, at about midnight, one of my battalion chiefs was down on the scene uh, and confirmed that there was high confidence the fire was going to be contained within a couple of days. Uh, and then about 2 a.m. Uh, Tuesday morning, the winds kicked up and the fire dramatically took off. Uh, I was down there at about 5.30 Tuesday morning. That was before we established the pilot car on the highway. And uh, from the Pew Creek uh, parking lot right there, you could see active flames. So at that point, AFD w was requested to re-respond because we hadn't been there since Saturday night, and we dispatched about eight units down to Rainbow Valley uh, to prepare for structure protection, protection for uh, that particular community. Of course, the, the, the call went out for hotshot teams uh, throughout Alaska, and we actually ended up bringing <coughs> five hotshot teams in from the lower 48. Uh, Division of Forestry established uh, Wednesday morning uh, incident command. Tom Kurth became the incident commander. Excellent gentleman. Uh, total assets staffed up to about 300 people at that time. All 17 structures within uh, Rainbow Valley uh, were uh, knocked on. Uh, hoses were laid. Uh, sprinklers were set up. And we felt very confident that uh, that particular subdivision was in good shape. Uh, one of the press releases, though, early on, I think this is Tuesday evening, uh, talked about the fire advancing to the east. Because one of the interesting things about the Turnigan Arm is it actually runs east-west. It doesn't run north-south. Most people think it's north-south. but So it's west and east, and then the south-facing wall is what we all drive along and love to see the goats. Uh, but uh, we felt pretty confident uh, that, that 
Rain, uh, Rainbow Valley was being protected, but the announcement talked about the fire moving to the east, but backing up to the west and approaching the Potter Valley subdivision. And that, and that quite literally threw a scare into a lot of the residents up on the upper hillside. Uh, and one of the things, two things that came out of this fire which are excellent is the public uh, uh, understanding of the Ready, Set, Go program. Uh, and this is a division of forestry uh, program where you want to keep it simple, so if there's a fire in your particular area, you'll be told either ready, set, or go. And ready means just be situationally aware. Where are the passports? Where's the prescription medicine? Where are the kids? What are we going to do about the animals? Don't really do anything yet. Just begin to gather your thoughts so that if you are told to go, you're not thinking about it. And, and set means start packing. You should, you should start loading the car. Don't evacuate yet, but, but be prepared. And go, of course, means obey the instructions of the Anchorage Police Department, Division of Forestry, Anchorage Fire Department, and get out of Dodge. So uh, that's a very simple program. We're trying to do a lot of advertising about that program. And if you haven't heard about it, uh, you can go on to akfireinfo.com. You can go to the Muni website for Anchorage Fire Department. And it's just called Ready, Set, Go. That's probably all you need to do is put it into a Google search, and you'll get all the information. The other thing that was tremendously important from this fire was the public education about fire lives. Because uh, over the three to four days of the immediate fire, Sunday through Thursday, uh, there was a tremendous amount of work done, particularly in the Rainbow Valley, uh, making all 17 structures in there fire wise. And of course, I think you've seen on the news the film of these people in the upper part of Valley also doing the same thing, getting neighbors in, clearing brush, removing the, the bark, that's the decorative bark right up against the house. Uh, that's not a good thing to have. Rocks, cement, brick maybe, but not bark. So the FireWise program and the Ready, Set, Go were, were two things that came out of this uh, potentially bad fire that, that were very, very beneficial. Of course, then we got the rain, uh, which was absolutely phenomenal. Uh, a little bit dangerous for the firefighters. In fact, for the first three to four days, uh, we really didn't have boots on the ground. The people that were on the ground were doing structure protection and fire-wise assessments because that valley, you know, 35, 40 degree slopes, uh, there's very few trails, and then trying to walk through there uh, amidst the water and uh, the rain and the fallout uh, was, was pretty dangerous. So crews actually didn't get into the ground until much later into the fire. but. Uh, uh, so the Anchorage Fire Department responded initially, then we took a couple days off while forestry was hitting it. We went into a structure protection mode on Wednesday in uh, Rainbow Valley, then moved up to Potter Valley, and we staged our assets uh, up there for about, about three days. And then on Friday the 28th, I think, uh, at least on the 28th, I think that was a Friday, uh, Division of Forestry terminated their command. Uh, they, they continue to watch for hot spots. And the problem with the forest fire, the, the, the bottom layer is, is called duff. And the fire can actually continue to smolder and burn uh, for up to a year uh, without any recognition. And unless you get terribly heavy rains, and we got some really good rains, uh, that smoldering layer of duff can continue. And next spring, uh, when the winds kick up, you can have a reemergence of the fire. So that's what they're watching for now. They've got the infrared cameras. They do flyovers, and they're checking for the area. And, and of course, your Anchorage Fire Department uh, stands ready 24-7 uh, in order to respond. A uh, couple things uh, just to note that earlier this spring, uh, we met out in the Matsu Valley, Anchorage Fire Department, myself, uh, Division of Forestry, Matsu Emergency Operations folks, our EOC folks, uh, participated in, I think, two or three drills uh, leading up to this particular fire. So the, uh, the collective cooperation between our agency and the state agency was, was, was spot on, uh, was seamless. And then we actually had a couple drills of our own. We had the fire over by the, uh, uh, the permit center, the bus barn, uh, earlier this summer. Uh, you may have seen the pictures that the drone uh, took of that particular fire. Uh, again, no wind that night, so uh, called in Division of Forestry. They brought in the air assets, and we got that fire knocked down in about three hours. And then about a month later, we had out in uh, Eagle River Valley another emerging fire. But again, the winds uh, were to our benefit, and with uh, the retardant tankers of Calmer, as well as the uh, helicopter bucket assets, 
we were able to knock down that fire. But again, DOF and AFD, uh, APD all responded. So we actually had two attempts to practice before the Q fire came. And, uh, you know, I, I gave kudos to uh, Tom Kurth and his team when I went up for the initial public uh, community meeting on that Wednesday. Uh, and then we had the mayor go up uh, that Friday and address all of the first responders and thank them for their cooperation. So uh, I think your fire department responded very, very well. The community responded in an exemplary fashion and the weather uh, cooperated too. So I'm not sure who we thank for that, but thank you. Well, we have some other wet weather coming, so I think yeah. we're not gonna be first for a couple days. Uh, Mr. Peterson first. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Then, uh, I, I think this was a, a, a great practice run, so to speak, you know, it, uh, probably wake up call of several people that uh, on Hillside to maybe do a little work around their homes to clear, clear give themselves a, a little more uh, a clearing break around their, their house, make it more defensible. Uh, but I'm, I'm wondering about the Ready, Set, Go program. What is the procedure if someone decides they're not going? I mean, if they're, they're saying we're going to stay here with the hose and we're going to, we're going to, we're going to uh, you know, protect our house at all costs ourselves. Yeah, Bill Miller, of course, uh, Deputy, Command, uh, Deputy Chief of the Anchorage Police Department, was at the public hearing on Wednesday night and actually addressed that question. And the bottom line is we're going to ask you for the names of your next of kin so we can <laughs> share with them what happened to you. <laughs> but uh, at, at a moment like that, it would take too many assets to physically force people to uh, evacuate. So we're just going to get the names of your next kin. So, so we'll identify anybody who come in contact, anybody who's at that structure, and there's no way to force them into the new home. We can try to track that the best we can of actually who at those properties. Yeah, I just wonder what you see, John. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Steele, sir? Yeah, I, I was just going to say, Chief, good job by everybody on that. And I'm glad we have a good relationship with the state. Um, is there a need for us to have any wildfire equipment? Uh, trucks with large tires? That well, here? well, we actually do. Uh, we have, uh, of course, we have our forester, John C. Uh, well, he's a contractor. Uh, he, he did a great job. He set up an information booth at the bottom of Potter Valley. Uh, he's the one who manages our firewise assessment program with the four hillside stations. Uh, we do have a lot of uh, wildland hose. It's the inch and a half. It's the small white hose. Uh, we do have a couple of brush rigs. But uh, having people who can hike up 45 degrees, you know, the Pioneer Peak, uh, the Chitna, uh, the Gannett Cruise, the Hotshot Cruise from the lower 48, these are all people who take the winter off, basically, do what they like to do, and then for three to five years, they fight forest fires. And they have type one, type two, type three, and type four. So we brought in an, a modified type one crew, and, and this is what they're trained for. So we can fight small fires, grass fires. We can go in maybe a quarter of a mile into the woods, but once you go beyond that without established roads, the Anchorage Fire Department is a structure fire protection farm. So we have minimal assets, but with Palmer, uh, Division of Forestry being so close, uh, maybe we've just been lucky. Do with the base, and do they have uh, equipment? Uh, not, not for forest firefighting. Okay. Uh, we do have, of course, uh, cooperative agreements yeah. with Ted Stevens, Jay Bear. Uh, of course, both of the, uh, the, the volunteer, Chugiak and Girdwood. Uh, and then we have a Matsu regional agreement. We got a lot of, uh, a lot of property lines. Yep. Yep. But a good job by all, and I think it gave uh, gave all of us that are down the flatlands a uh, a reminder also to be firewise. And you so may recall having seen we actually had three Black Hawk helicopters uh, from the military that was flying bucket loads. So one day there was actually eight helicopters. Oh, okay. Pretty impressive seeing them rotate yeah. through and yeah. That's good. Thank you, still. Mr. Whittleton, since this fire happened in your area, we're sure you caused it. Do you want to talk to the chief now? Well, just briefly, uh, you know, I thought it went pretty well. I was real impressed with the communication and coordination amongst the agency. I went to the command center several times. We had, uh, I think that first public meeting in the South had over 150 people there to learn. That's really pretty big. Uh, the next one was almost that many. Uh, so I think people are 
are very attentive now. I think one thing to focus on the future is that wood lot is very valuable because it makes it so easy to get wood and wood and wood and wood the same thing. And I think people have gotten much mellower than they were 10, 15 years ago, but people use that consistently. And I expect it's up a lot right now. It is. But without that wood lot, you have a problem. What do you do with your wood? You might ship it, you might pile it in your yard. You're not really getting where you need to be with it. So I hope we do all we can to meet that operating. Yeah, we're really not uh, a wilderness city anymore. So the idea of having the big spruce bark beetle kill bonfire in your backyard, it's, it's not a backyard anymore. It's the backyard to somebody else's house. So we're, we're, we're very concerned about releasing the community to go back to backyard burning. Uh, anything else, Joe? I haven't used my fire ring in three years, I mean, you know, so, or at least three years. Uh, it's all piled up there nice with a nice uh, fire built in there just waiting to be touched off. But, uh, well, done responsibly, fire rings are permitted. All right. With a cover. I just worry about it. Yeah, with a cover. <laughs> Mr. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Um, every chance I get, I try to remind people of the fire line where they call. Most people aren't familiar with the rules, um, and whether it's Betsy Grow or Anchorage, they're different. Um, but I, th I find when you start educating people, they actually have thanked me many, many times because they just didn't know. There was a fire line, an automated line, they called to see the burn situation last few days. So if some of the members aren't familiar, I think it's something helpful that you can tweet out, you can go on your Facebook, just a reminder, especially when it gets dry, that that's out there. Um, my question's a little different, Chief. Um, it's about the volunteer fire department. Um, in the last three or four days, um, I've received contact um, from CVFD responding um, or, or having a little bit of um, concern about mutual aid from CVFD for Station 11. Specifically, I'm not sure if you're aware, but it's something maybe you can do a little more research and come back and ask me offline. But Specifically, and I can't remember, I, I wrote down the numbers, but I don't have it on this piece of paper, but um, over the past year and a half, two years, there's been numerous times where CDFD has been called because uh, Station 11's paramedics were out, just to make sure they had paramedics there. Right. And um, my understanding with their new staffing program and, and what they have is they have paramedics seven days a week, 24 hours a day. It's unusual when they don't. Um, that's what I'm being told. But the concern is, they're being called saying, hey, do you have a paramedic? And as soon as um, their captains get that call, immediately what they do is they, they, they make sure the rest of the best are ready, and they put them at Station 35 to make sure they're ready. Okay. But we're not getting the upgraded, um, basically call out, I don't know what you call it, stand up, it's not stand down. You know, basically, um, it's not being logged how many times CBFD is actually stand okay. by for AFD. So, um, I think that is a good data point because it's come up in this committee before. How many times do we go help them? So that would be a station move up from station 35 to station 11. We're, and they're not even moving because you okay. know station 35 is right there. It's right there. So there's no reason for them to move. But they are calling in their people okay. and having a, but it's kind of like off the cuff, like, oh, well, you guys ready? And when they get that call, they know. I mean, I think it happened in the last week and a half where both of our paramedics from Eagle River were gone. And so, you know, they go and they do it, but then there's this, there's this, you know, I know, I understand there's this, you know, tug between the union and the volunteers and all that nonsense. But for us, I think it's helpful, especially the public safety committee. So when somebody asks you how many times do we go help them, it's also helpful to understand it is mutual. Okay. And so oh. if you can look into that and understand what the story is, because, you know, like I said, one side of the story, I, I like to have your perspective and okay. understand and in fact, if we're having them stand by, let's just log it so we can track it. Okay. That'd be helpful. Will. Will do. Thanks, Chief. Anything else from some of the members? Should you know about anything? Uh, I'll do it. Go ahead. Just going off of Ms. Anoski's last point, the muni out of the AP Firewise info on the head, the muni.org homepage is on that scroller right now, right when the fire happened, we will be informed. But we don't plan on taking that down. So residents can also find that information right now. And of course, the other one we promote is Nixle. Yeah. Uh, EOC is tremendous, APD <coughs> is tremendous. We're equally as good in sending out Nixle alerts for all kinds of things like this. So if you don't have Nixle on your iPhone or whatever that device is, get it. 
We appreciate Nick. So those of us that have it, it's a good way to get information across Anchorage as to what's happening. Appreciate that. Okay. Chief, you. any truth to rumor that there was a run on U-Hauls when the fire was going on? People trying to line up U-Hauls to put their stuff in and take it off? Well, as I said, when, when that one announcement went out and talked about the fire advancing to the east but backing up and was only a mile away from Potter Valley, uh, that, that sent a little bit of a scare through some of the residents up there. And I do know that uh, we had some people in tears thinking that they were going to lose their houses. So um, I think probably a number of people did move to, to try to rent new halls, but it, it, it wasn't too dramatic. And, and we, we need to be careful with the message we give. And that's why we're so uh, wanting to promote the ready, set, go. Yeah. Keep it simple. Be ready. We're not telling you to go. Just get ready. So. Now we heard a gentleman up there has a has water available, wants to have a fire hydrant put in or something? Uh, have that's, you seen that's, that? Yeah, that's uh, Justin Green, and that's the Alaska <laughs> rugby field that's been built up on Finland, way up there. Uh, in fact, Tom Kurth, the incident commander for the Division of Forestry, uh, sent us a letter encouraging us to uh, explore the opportunity to put a hydrant in at, uh, at his location. Apparently, he has a, a well that can go up to 600 gallons a minute, uh, and, and we're going to talk to them about that okay. because it is a great water resource. You could let us know next month when we have this meeting again. Sure. We'll have to track what's happening because yes. I'm concerned about that. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for bringing that up because, yes, you probably haven't seen it yet, but yesterday we received an email from a gentleman with a letter talking about that very subject, and I forwarded it to you. Yes, I got that. Oh, great. And that was the same that. letter that Tom well, Kurth had provided wonderful. me a week earlier. That's great. So hopefully yep. we can get a response. Than yep. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. We'll Chair. Have, if we've got a hydrant up there, we'll help yeah. you with the fight the fire. It's easier to haul it down than up. It's easier to haul it down than Anything, Mr. Wilson? No, but we'll be working on that. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Chief. Thank you. Moving on down next to Health Department. Steve? Right here, thank you. Um, Melinda apologizes for not being able to be here today, um, but we did provide two dashboards, one for the Anchorage Safety Center Safety Patrol, which is uh, um, a summation of the annual report that we put out each year, and the second one is the Animal Care and uh, Control Center report. I'm prepared to talk about either one in whatever order you would like. Uh, but I, I, I'd have to say that I brought Michael Tierney with me, who's our program manager, and he manages the um, Animals Care and Control Center and knows much more about their operations than, than I do. Uh, and I also note for the animal control, um, care and control, that we had an uh, uh, inaccurate number, so I've got a corrected form. And what we'd be looking at is the second row third column a uh, number of dead animals there should be 19 for May I think it was a much higher number um, so we're 56 listed on here. right that's incorrect um, so we've got a new new form and we're hoping that this is information that will be useful for you uh, and if not we can provide some other data points that uh, uh, see if we can provide some other data points uh, for either one of these reports. But with the Anchorage Safety Center and Safety Patrol, um, you know, we've received uh, a little over 2,000 calls during the first six months of this year. Um, transports, there's 753 transports over to the Safety Center. Um, the intakes that we've had have been 931. Um, I will say that that's a substantial reduction from last year. Uh, at the same time, we had uh, over 1,600 uh, intakes uh, this same time last year. And actually, what we are seeing is a trend a reduction in, in intakes uh, for the safety center for this year compared to the previous two years. Uh, and then we just show releases um, where the fire department or EMTs have come in and, and responded to uh, clients at the safety center uh, because of medical emergencies or whether or not we had to re uh, um, release some clients to the police department because of perhaps of aggressive behavior and things of that nature. Um, so with that, I hope this uh, um, report will be beneficial to you and I'd be happy to answer any of the questions on the report. Oh, yes, the question. Mr. Dunbar. 
Yeah, I, I, so I was looking at this before you, you started talking uh, about, and I noticed as well, we, we seem to have a pretty significant reduction, and it, it seems to go year to year, 2014, 15, 15 to 16. That's not quite a long enough time to see a real time series, but it's, it might be negative of something. And so I'm, I'm curious, what do you think is driving the lower numbers of intake of the safety center? Um, well, I don't know, and we've expanded services to 24 hours during that same, that, that, that same period. We do have more housing. There's a few things going on. We have more housing available. The Housing First, uh, or permanent supportive housing, is uh, more readily available than it has been in the past with um, um, Sitka Place coming online in addition to Carlick Manor. The state also has 70 housing vouchers uh, that were available for um, a special pro program for mental health trust beneficiaries, which includes um, um, chronic inebriates uh, and individuals with mental health, and one of the priorities is those which are frequent users of emergency services. So there's that. There's the bash veterans vouchers that have came online, and I think that was 120 vouchers. So we're seeing more people being getting housed. That's one of the things that I, that I can say. Just one quick follow up on that. I see we have a member of the press here. Um, and it sounds like we don't have a clear enough sense exactly if there's a causal relationship between the increase in housing and the reduction in services. But if there's some way for you guys to establish that and do a little more research, that's a great story that we'd like to hold. Sure. Because this, this body has made an effort to invest in more housing. The mayor's made an effort to invest in more housing. And part of the part of the reasoning is because we think it's going to redu reduce emergency <coughs> services that are expensive. And if we are actually doing that, then I hope that that's a story that gets told. Is that all, Yes. Mr. Peterson, first. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, and I'm going to go off through this separate topic. And, and this is specific to my district. I've had a gentleman that's been calling me for two years about boombox cars driving down Turpin in the middle of the night, waking him up time after time after time. And uh, he, he's fed up. And I, I don't know what we can do about it. I'm just throwing it out there as to, to you to see if you have any ideas. I would imagine that some of these 60 some uh, noise complaints had to have come from this gentleman. Uh, I know it's difficult to to enforce the, the, the loud noise and the ordinance, but uh, the, if the car's going down the road and it's loud enough that it's shaking your windows and it feels like an earthquake every night, it, it seems like we have, we have to figure something else out. That would be a tough one in it for, for, uh, for, for us because we do issue noise permits for different events, but if it's a boombox and an automobile, you know, we, 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 we can't track that. But these um, noise complaints are specific to animals uh, where animal control uh, officers went out and um, uh, either were responding to a complaint. Um, but to your other question, if it's a you know if it's a permitted event, then we go out and we've got two phone calls from an individual we'll investigate the complaint. And, uh, but on the boombox and automobile driving down, I don't know unless it's a police. Uh, well, actually, I think uh, our chairman has a story shirt with you because we had a guy on the Sunday this in Czech Land that tried to address this issue. Elvis, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Briefly, many years ago, when I was not in assembly. But anyway, there is an ordinance on the books um, to address that very issue. So, you know, it's hard to enforce. So maybe we need to revisit it um, again, because that's been a really long time ago. A lot of people don't even know that it's there. So, anyway, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm trying to determine what noise really is, because I've had some people come to us before and say, if I can hear my neighbors playing music across the lot line, that's noise. Well, there's no magic bullet on a lot line that stops the noise from coming from there to you. So I, we deal with this all the time, and it's hard to really figure out a way to enforce the noise ordinance. I know you guys gave a permit to somebody down in the ball fields, McKay, one time. We were getting complaints from the hillside. They could hear the noise out of the air down there. It was and it was after hours for their printing. <coughs> really upset some people sometimes. Uh, John, you're next. Why does it, <coughs> then Amy? When you say Anchorage Safety Patrol Van, is that different than the uh, CSP Community Service Patrol 
Um, it used to be called community service patrol, I think, but it is the same. Did we hear something where they're not going to renew their, there's a contractor? And their renewal is up on October 1st, and we're working with them right now. Our staff are putting together the renewal documents, and we're in negotiation with them. We don't, we, we don't have any decision yet. Uh, we'll look and we'll we'll have to work with them and make sure that we don't we don't know we, we don't have anything finalized yet. Amy, uh, thank you, Chair Trini. Um, I think I thought the same call from the exact same individual, and I think uh, when um, Chief Yu was here, we had a discussion, and there was a point where he did a couple of traffic officers because it was the same area, Turpin area. Late at night, and, and I know at least one in time they had an officer that kind of sat in the area. Um, but I can tell you, the one for if it's the same individual, which I suspect it is, it's got it's it's escalated to the point. The last I spoke with him, where he was uh, talking about he's going to get his gun and go out there himself. And so when we talk about this, I, I know it sounds kind of funny to some of us, but it it really is a real world escalating issue especially in this Turpin area. And I think um, I think we would all rather see some proactive diffusion of the situation rather than see a confrontation between neighbors because it's going to get ugly. And that's what I'm afraid of because I think it's probably the same person. I'm pretty confident it's the same person. And he knows where the guy lives because he's followed him home. Yeah, so and, the, and the, this is my point. It is, it is escalating. And when they say to me, you know what, I got my blank blank gun and I'm going to deal with a blank blank situation that's the point when I approached Chief Mew and it seemed like it had calmed down for a little bit um, and I haven't I actually have two missed calls on my phone from him in the last couple of days I think it's the same person so um, got me on speed dollars. so I think this is one of those situations um, honestly I think APD probably should be involved and I think um, you know we have to especially when assembly members are recognizing the situations escalating um, it's something we have to put our heads together and try to diffuse. Well, Mr. Busk, you may want to give the phone number since you know who it is to the chief. You guys want to make, might want to make a call to him because it will escalate. If it's the same one I think it is, he's a, an irrational when it comes to noise. He doesn't want it to come into his property from anybody. I have to check if it's the same one. Like I said, I, I haven't called him back yet, but if it's the same issue. Well, I mean, if we have a car driving down Turpin, there's going to be more than one person that's going to hear, if it's loud enough that it's shaking people's windows and they think it's an earthquake and they get woke up day after day after day, it's probably not just one person that's upset about it. Well, I said, when Chuck tried to do this, the problem was trying to do with the boom boxes and cars, but there's no real good way to deal with it because I know a health department has a way to measure sound, but they only work, I think, for specific hours. And sometimes we get these calls at 1 in the morning, and they're not working at those hours. And the police department doesn't have the meter to measure the noise level. Well, they prioritize calls, too. Yeah. So, I mean, I think we all understand the challenges, but I think we all also agree that we don't want to see no. a conflict between neighbors. That would be a noise level issue. So if we could be provided the information, certainly we'll do it. I'm suspecting it's probably the same <coughs> You guys can exchange phone numbers, then give it to the chief, and we'll see that it's the same person. <laughs> Any other questions for helping? Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. You're moving down to uh, emergency management. Yeah. Once again, chief took all my thunder, so I have nothing to say. Uh, anyways, the wildfire, uh, just to let you know, we did not ramp up the EOC for this event. But, however, we did uh, notify people in the EOC that it's possible that we would be ramping up. We had conference calls with uh, the school district, uh, with Red Cross about sheltering, uh, and possibly evacuation. Uh, Rainbow Valley has roughly 27 uh, residents that live out there, while Potter Valley had 427 or so. So we did look at both issues, uh, where we have to shelter people, where we have to thank. We have, so all those plans were put in place. So uh, we we're ready to go at any time to raise that deal thing. We can work for us. So. That worked out really well. We did have uh, our public information officers working full time on this, uh, along with the fire department and the uh, uh, APD. Uh, so other than that, uh, we're working on outreach uh, 
event. We have an exercise coming up on the 23rd and 24th, working with the Department of Health, the State Department of Health, and uh, the AFD. They'll be doing an exercise at an airlift out of, uh, I believe it's uh, basically a, a cruise ship on it, doing the out of Raymond's going to go ahead and have an accident. We're going to be airlifting people in the tank. So that will be on the 23rd, 24th. But it's more of a paper drill, uh, talking about how we evacuate people, how the hospitals would have been affected if we had to bring in a large number of people. And other than that, that's about all I have for you. Questions, Mr. Right, Mr. Steele, sir. Yeah, um, I, I remember, I remember the uh, high schools. Have uh, Connex mm -hmm. supplies in them theoretically. I don't know the condition of that. I know uh, George Vacatus was concerned that it hadn't been tended to. Correct. And I don't know what the situation is. If there is the need to evacuate people, uh, the emergency center down here, or where where do people go and where are the cots all stored? Well, like yeah. that? There's a couple of questions on that. Is, uh, first of all, when we decide to evacuate people, we'll send them to an initial uh, care center. So say, say we send them to South High. That was our original where we were going to send people. We send them to South High to, uh, to group up, uh, and then we would just determine from there how many people actually need shelter, and then we'd pick a shelter at that point. We don't normally pass that out because uh, we don't want people going to a rec center or someplace that's yeah. not going to have supplies. We have supplies in uh, trailers that we can bring out to uh, Department of Health has them. We have them. Red Cross has them. So if we had to move supplies, we can move supplies to where we decide to shelter. Uh, as far as the school, uh, they are re-looking at their inventory, seeing what's expired, what has not expired, whether or not they want to operate it, and that's up to the school district to decide on that. But they have 20, uh, kind of, or, yeah, 20 uh, high schools and elementary schools identified with Connex. Uh, I know they were they were they were gearing towards uh, earthquake issues, kind right. of that type of thing, as opposed to uh, fire evacuation. So. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, they do need. If we're going to have them. We need to have them uh, checked very carefully, yeah. updated, and uh, suitable to do the job. And they also said it was just job. I had. <coughs> I, just in that fire, I had some comments from some people who are involved with it. And they're going, "Where's your OE office? Where were you?" Yeah. Um, they're, we're here. Where are they? And we just don't ever see them. We never see them in training, and so on. And so I asked about it. So what you're faced with those things is APD and the fire department. And you guys are staying back, coordinating from there. It sounds fine to me. But the message wasn't out to these other people who operate different. They are there, um, right out front. So. And then I, so I didn't, uh, I mean, it's hard for the groups to know who's who. Maybe you guys were there. And then so uh, the last uh, Friday meeting at a table there, and giving things out, there was a presence. So it, it's almost like it's more of a PR thing to those other groups. We don't operate like you, right? We operate well, but not like you. And just let them know. So, I mean, you've done with that before? Yeah, uh, Director Spillers went ahead and attended the last uh, couple of meetings to make sure the public got to see that we're there. Uh, the difference between uh, uh, there's a different different a definition that a lot of people need to understand. Uh, we're the while we're called the emergency operations center, we're not an operations center per se. We're more of a support center. So whatever the fire department needs, the police need, uh, we support them. So we're not out dictating uh, where the fire lines are, what they're going to do. So we tend to kind of hold back a little bit because uh, we're here for them. Whatever they need, and we're providing. Uh, but when we'll step forward is if there is a shelter need or if there's an evacuation need, uh, then we're in the front there with them. We got to rebrand them. Yeah. Emergency support center. Yeah. But it sounds better. Mind to me. Operation center sounds cooler. So. Yeah. <laughs> it sounds very cool. Yeah. Do you know where it's located at, John? Have you been down there? I used to live right there at the LATU building. So it's yeah. Okay. 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 Do, you guys, do you guys set up and regularly drill the answer commands? Yes, sir. In fact, we had a wildfire drill uh, prior to this. Uh, we went off a hillside uh, fire drill that we performed had our emergency operation personnel all attend and work through all those issues. Uh, it's just it's just good to uh, to grease the relationships with all those folks uh, yeah. that show up and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Keep them uh, keep them aware. Who's, who's who. Yep. Mr. Steele. Yes, sir. Um, 
Any other questions from any members? Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Moving down the agenda now, we're down down the new business referral of assembly agenda item to the committee. It's our quarterly bar safety hour. We got this one document here on it. Amanda, do you want to address this issue or not? It's I think Mandy and I can address it together. Forrest okay. had some questions at meeting at the beginning of July, so if we wanted to address them on the record. So you had kind of wanted to just know about the history of it. Um, there's five bars that are currently holding permits, um, and as you mentioned, one of them is now no longer in business, um, and they're coming up for renewal. And so, to address some of your questions, um, Barbara had mentioned her thoughts on it was, a lot of bars may not be participating because they can't get any revenue from that extra hour. Um, so some bars may be apprehensive to join. Um, and then also, bars that hold a restaurant designation permit don't need to hold this permit because they qualify for those same hours. Um, I think another thing to explore with this is when we started having this bar safety hour back in 2013, this is when we started the conversation, I think maybe it was 2014 when we finalized it, um, what were the concerns that brought about this permit? Um, is this permit specifically addressing those concerns or not addressing those concerns? Um, and even though we do have these five permit holders of which four are operating, I, um, you know, I'm not out downtown, <laughs> so I'm not actually sure if these places are staying open that extra, a lot of time, but it would be actually interesting to see if they are actually specifically taking advantage of it or not. Um, I think that would be an interesting thing for the assembly and maybe specifically this committee to explore some of those questions. John, the reason we brought this forward originally, sorry, not John, but Forrest, the reason we brought this originally forward is because bars at the bar hour, all these people turned into the street. And there's not enough taxi cabs, according to the industry, to handle all these people that are loose. And so what we did was come up with this as a way to measure the people being released. So if farmers wanted to, they could sail for an extra hour, not serve alcohol, but just as a way to allow the taxi cab and people to come pick them up. So that's the reason we came up with this. Ms. Greg Jackson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It was implemented in 2013, but one of the things that we need to address is um, AO 2015-93 because um, this is going to sunset August 31st, 2016, if we, um, we don't we readdress it. So I think that this committee needs to, to make a recommendation on how we, we're going to go forward. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Dunbar. So I, I, um, I'm, I'm pretty familiar with, with the thinking behind why it was put in place. I was hoping that someone could be from people from the um, bar owners the lady there in the nice yellow jacket. Wonderful. Um, I know that this had this meeting happens to conflict with the Anchors Downtown Partnership safety meeting, which is going on as we speak. So I think some of the bar owners were there. Um, but so I, I'd, lo I'd love to speak with someone who is either using this program or not using this program, and, and sort of think about why they aren't, and if if there are ways that we can get. If we think it's a valuable program, and I think it is. If there are ways that we can make it more appealing so that more people apply for it. So I'm sorry, ma'am. I have enough. Participants in the downtown area, which is the 
pedestrian designation of permits out there, which they do not have to go through the municipal clerk's office in order to participate in the program, meaning as an establishment like Coots, LED, and some others. So they do not have to go through the program. They are able to stay per the ordinance, to stay open up to an hour with no music, no alcohol service, in order to get people safe at home. Um, the five participants that are listed in here, they had um, come to me because we just met, and they said, well, ask them, what is the negative impact that this program has that the assembly may not want to continue this program? And let's see what the benefits are. The benefits are, and it's always been, public safety keeping our patrons safe, up to an hour. No alcohol, no music, no entertainment, a way for people to use the restroom. Downtown is known for people to urinate in little corners. So guess what? Now this particular venues are staying open. People can finish using the bathroom. Re-entry though, re-entry is only if you have to use the bathroom. If you go out, you're going to stay in, you're going to wait for your cab, or if you're safe at right home, that's the way it works. But if you're going to go because your right is here, then you have to use the bathroom, the let you come in, but you have to go back out of your right is here. They're really particular because they don't want to take the, the chance or the opportunity for any liquor or alcohol to come back into the license price. Am I making sense of what I'm saying so far? So that's, that's what the program is, and we want to continue it. And again, the message is, what, what is it that, or why would you want to continue this program? What's the negative part that this program can take? Mr. Dunbar, so I guess my question would be, um, so there are only four participants because the avenue is closed, and I'm not actually sure, like. The avenue is not closed. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, you're right. They're all, I'm, I'm just thinking of, um, you're right. So, so we have the uh, five of them. Um, the, uh, do they, I, I, I haven't been outside, I haven't been downtown in a while. Do they actually, do they actually all stay open until 4 a.m.? Sometimes, not all the time. If the need is there, they will stay open. If the need is not there, they, they will not stay open. Mainly because it's men hours that they have to put out in order for them to stay open. That is an hour. So, bar, traditional bar break is at 2.30 a.m., is that right? Chief, would you mind, what would you say your general perception is right now of what is 2.30 a.m. on a Friday or Saturday night like downtown? Uh, is it well managed in general? Are people being able to get the cabs? Or is there a congregation of people? Are we having issues with public safety issues? Are we having call outs for officers? Well, it varies from time to time. No clear pattern to it. And a lot of this is self selection how individuals choose to go out in the evening, what arrangements they made, or their lack of arrangements that they made at the last minute. It, it really becomes more of a planning type issue when you plan to attend an event, what is your exit strategy, what is your strategy to the park? So you'd say in general, at 2.30 a.m. on Friday and Saturday nights, we don't have a concentration of people on the streets and we don't have a lot of public safety problems downtown? Well, from time to time, by all means, we do. It could be, there's at times great numbers of men down there, but it, it varies tremendously. Thanks. Um, well, I, I mean, I'm certainly in favor of, of extending the program, uh, extending, at least extending the program we have, um, but I'm wondering if there are ways that we can make it uh, more favorable to get more participation. Now, if the industry doesn't want it to be more favorable, it doesn't well, want it, that's well, great. If I can. More yeah. participation. Can I can answer that. Sure. Um, we also, you know, as proactive as my board is, we tried to, uh, back in 2005, we started a program called Off the Road Program. I don't know if you've heard of the Off the Road. You yeah. have? So I don't have to explain it. So those are ways that we want people to plan ahead of what they're going to do at the end of the day. But it doesn't happen like that. Downtown is hot. And if you come downtown in the, if you're in the weekend, Friday and Saturday nights, there is not enough <coughs> tax cab availability. 
for the demand. There's none. So people, do they plan? Do they forget to plan? We try to give them ways to plan, but they don't most of the time. So as a proactive industry and my board of directors, they would like to have this program in place. And the other world program is free to the patron. We pay for that program. So um, we're trying to find ways to make downtown or the whole city, not just downtown, but the whole city safe. One thing that I'm going to tell you, Mr. Goldfire, is that I know that a lot of the assembly members did not like this, but a lot of the um, venue owners, the licensees, they're saying that it would be better if you let them finish that last drink instead of taking it away from them. So if, if you let them finish, no service after 3 o'clock, because that's the long, right? So if you let them finish that last drink, that would really and truly cost them to go out slow and not to rush out, because they really just want to continue partying. That's what they want to do. Now, people that plan, they will take time, or they're more conscious into a safe way home, then they'll call the cab, they wait for a cab. In the summer months, people head out. In the winter, they will, you know, come in and stay indoors, of course, because of the cold weather. So this is my last point before we move on. So right now, the program functions is, um, you know, the, the bar closes, and maybe have a safety hour, but now you have to have send your staff around to go collect the drinks out of the hands. Is that how it works now? That's my law. They sweep the bar. What's that? They sweep the bar. Right, but at a place like the Pioneer Bar, they'd also have to go to where people are standing in the back or standing by the tables and physically take them from people before they finish. Them. Different, so different owners do different things, but what I have seen is they sweep the bar. They don't want to have a, any liquor anywhere in the, anywhere in the, in the establishment. Potential right. okay. What we need from this body is just a motion to the assembly to keep this program renewed another three years. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, why do we have to put a limit on it? Why don't we just There's renew it and don't, and don't put a, an expiration date on it? And, if, and if in the future we need to change things and change it so we don't have to keep revisiting because it seems to be working, that's my recommendation. I, I, had, I had a question yeah. before we were, we were talking about what you were talking about. Uh, you were I didn't get down to there. When, okay. when this when this happened, when we instituted it, we were having gunfights in the street, we were people in the street. A lot of a uh, lot of bad behavior. And uh, this this was an idea to try to try to make that into a little bit. And I guess I'd like to hear from the chief in terms of how are things now? You know, uh, are they working, are they not? In terms of sweeping, that whole purpose was to keep people from buying, you know, giving five beers and uh, let's get close to the hour and sit there and have five beers to drink. And, and, uh, you know. Well, it's been a long time since I've ordered five beers. <laughs> uh, any, any, so, so uh, what was your question, Tim, Mr. the Chief? Yes. Chief? Because we've got one other thing we need to deal with today. Dave? Okay. Uh, we need some time to assemble some more accurate information. I'm sorry. Uh, there, there are still incidents, but I don't know if it's driven by a lack of resources because diverted to other halls and priority, that are taking priority, things like that. The other thing is uh, I'm aware that there are so few taxi cabs compared to the number of establishments that are called for services. So I'd be curious as to what they're feeling or their ability to aid in this situation. Anyway, I, I don't think there's a problem extent uh, just because it's we've something been, we've been very fortunate last year we've had a mild winter you want to call it winter. You get one winter it goes back to the three to below zero. You're gonna need to have this the job frozen people out of the street. John um, you know I my heavy drinking days but in New Orleans and there was no bar closed never had trouble with that. Yeah, I was telling you that you kick everyone out at a certain time. But um, what was what's the rationale that we I mean it's 
seems like if someone comes to grab my drink, now I'm going to pour it down real quick, and that's not a good solution. But I'm not going to give it up. So, I mean, what was the rationale of saying sweep the bar and close so that you finish? No serving. Amanda? I'm happy to answer that question. I was raising my hand earlier. Um, the reason that the program had that in it is because bar service hours, even though they can stay open later, uh, bar service hours are set out in Chapter 10 of the Anchorage Municipal Code that service stops at that time. So that's why they want to make sure that nobody has drinks after that time to comply with that. Say the business may be seen a violation. Somebody might try to find the What sort of state? Um, it's, uh, it's Anchorage has tighter hours than the state does, so state's hours are a little bit longer, but in Anchorage, they're... Is the state still fine? Yeah, and they can open at 8, whereas ours have to open at 10 as well in the morning. Is there, so I see here at, um... D, uh, under D2C, it says no alcohol beverages may be sold or served or consumed during this bar safety hour. Um, if we were to change it to sold or served and take out consumed, would that allow people to, would they still have to sweep the bar? Yes. So, um, state hours, legal hours are from 8 a.m. to 5 a.m. However, different districts or municipalities like ourselves, they can have restrictive or restrictive hours of closing or opening, which in Anchorage, you know, of course, we're a little different. So the, the concern of the licensees, you know, and, and this is something that it was, is so important to them, and they, not, they don't want to really take a chance to just think about this for a minute. They can get a violation if they find that the ABC board or the AMOC office, I'll be on there one Whatever it is. Yeah. But um, if they find an enforcement officer finds anyone in the license premise with a drink after closing hours, they're going to get a notice violation, and they don't want to deal with that. Right. But how you know? However, there's some licensees like this five that are just plain bars that are willing to take that chance by making sure that they have good security, good bartenders, and sweep the whole bar. So what it means is no consumption, I mean no service after 3 a.m. That means they can finish their last drink, but no alcohol beverages will be sold. They start packing up, you know, closing their bar and whatever else they do as, as they go up to the night. So they're not willing to take that chance unless if they feel that this program is going to work. Does that answer we your need question? To, we do have another thing we've got to get to. Yeah. Time is running short. Amanda? It sounded like Chief Tolley was going to do some additional research, and the clerk's office would be willing to look into some more information on the taxi cab part of that, and we could maybe get together. And when do we need to have this the legislation in front of us to renew this? Is it August 31st? It sunsets the 31st. What? It sunsets the 31st, so we would need to do it August on the 3rd. 20th. Well, it's an ordinance, if I may, Mr. Chairman, yeah. it's an ordinance, so we don't have a public hearing on it. So that means it has to be on the agenda on Tuesday. That's correct. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So my question to you is, can you go ahead and get me the paperwork we need to introduce it on Tuesday so we can make the deadline? Because I don't want this thing to expire because we didn't take action on it. We can, we can debate the hours and every rest that you're talking about on the floor of the assembly. Would you like the clerk's office to set up a work session for them to maybe address some of these? If you would. Services. I just want to make sure we make the time requirements. So we're, we've got to move on. We already do, Sylvia. I'm sorry. Yes. We've got to move on. We've got this other item. We're now going to move down to item AR 2016-189, contract conditions for potential marijuana vendors and trade show promoters in this school facility. You want to discuss this? So it's coming, I think, out of the Department of Law. Yeah, I'm happy to share. Uh, Eric McConnell prepared this resolution. I'm circulating among the assembly members now a copy of Assembly Resolution 2015 130. In advance of the first proposed marijuana trade shows, the assembly adopted this resolution, which is prepared by Assembly Council. Uh, you will see that it contains a number of conditions that we would like to see placed on contracts for use of 
of municipal facilities that were having marijuana in conventions. These contract provisions, we believe, have been rolled into all of the contracts that have featured marijuana events since that time. But the resolution was drafted with the anticipation that some of these things would be taken care of by the state regulations, although they really weren't. So there's language in it, um, page three, for instance, it says, we further resolve the assembly supports the following safeguards and supplemental contract provisions in advance of the time allowed to complete the state rulemaking. State rulemaking is now substantially complete, so it is put this AR 2015-130 in something of a limbo situation where it's not clear that the assembly is still resolving if there should be supplemental contract provisions for municipal facilities. So as proposed in AR 2016-189, uh, we had proposed to take the risk of conditions the assembly previously approved and make them permanent conditions on the use of municipal facilities for marijuana uh, events. And as described in the accompanying memorandum, there are just very small tweaks to each of the conditions that previously were approved that mostly are in the nature of cleanup. Um, this item was pulled at the request of assembly member Flynn, and I'm not sure what particular questions he had, but we are open to discussion on any of these. Here. Okay, I've got a question for you on item 15. Consumption marijuana on the premises strict prohibited. That's fine, but I, from my perspective, I'd like to see what the fine is if that's violated. I want the public to know, because just as tell them consumption of marijuana on the premises strict prohibited doesn't tell the public what the associated fine was for, for violating it. It's, to me, it's just telling the public ahead of time, this is the fine. And then if you go to item 14 on here, it's the event sponsor to provide a copy of the supplemental contract conditions to all vendors. And I'm wondering, shouldn't we have it available for the public too to look at on the wall? It's an idea. We certainly could. Um, Recognize Mr. Flynn showing this. Good timing. I don't have questions I have. I was just going <laughs> to text you actually. I was like, I have a journey, Mr. Flynn, but I'll ask your questions. <laughs> We're going to extend this meeting for a little bit. I want to discuss this now. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for Mr. your building. It's about a member of this committee. We're all a member of every committee, reality. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds true. So, um, if I may, Mr. Chair, my, yes, the reason I'd ask this to be pulled for discussion is. Um, we, when we've had these um, trade fairs, uh, have observed that consumption takes place. Um, and at uh, these facilities, we permit, for example, consumption of alcohol in a controlled environment. And so when we first heard the resolution referenced back here, 2015-130, uh, I suggested that we make a space available where it was legal for consumption, uh, and specifically that you know the deck here uh, on the Denina Center is a tent, control access um, only for product people brought themselves, not for sale, um, because the time sales weren't legal, and they're still not really. Um, and so I was hoping that this would reflect some recognition that if we're in fact allowing alcohol consumption in municipal facilities if it's possible, given that smoking is not allowed indoors, to allow for consum legal consumption in a controlled environment uh, for marijuana, it made sense. Um, it doesn't appear we've moved toward that, uh, but I was hoping that could be a consideration before we finalize this. Questions? Do you want them to answer that, or do you want to? I, well, I, I don't know if people want to. Debate it. Well, we can't debate it. I don't know if you want to have questions about it or, or if there's a way that, that the municipal attorney wants to express we could do it or what concerns he might have. I'm, I'm fine with the conversation going where it goes. I just want, I'd say we'd be happy to look into it. Our impetus for proposing the resolution was just to have something on the books now that AR 2015 is in this ambiguous status. Absent a change in direction or instruction to go in a change in direction, we hadn't really intended to move into a public consumption or quasi public. That's the role of body we'll take a look at. So you remember, Mr. Steele? Didn't we just, just outlaw all smoking down the center of Yes, we did. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Peterson. Continuity. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and 
Uh, just to follow up a little uh, additional item on what Mr. Quinn was talking about, I believe that a person who has an alcohol permit can get a special designation. So if they want to say, um, you know, go to a uh, sell at a special event, they can get uh, uh, permission to, to serve alcohol away from their premises for you know a certain number of times a year. So we are. Uh, relatively soon here in the next couple of months we're going to have uh, people that are going to be able to legally retail marijuana and they're, they're probably going to want to come to some of these conventions or trade shows in, with some of their product and if we're supposed to be treating alcohol and marijuana you know laws you know similarly it would make sense to me that if people with an alcohol license can do it, then it will not, it's not equal protection under the law if someone with a marijuana license can do it. What, Other comments, Mr. Main Members? I have a question. Mr. Dunbar, sir. So I, I'm not familiar with our, this is sort of a, a trade show provision, right? So this is mostly intended for, um, for sure. um have we ever had an alcohol trade show or like a, a beer and barley wine festival? And if so, <laughs> are they allowed to are they allowed to provide samples? Are they allowed to sell and consume alcohol? And if so, why should marijuana be treated differently? I guess that's a policy question. But the legal question is the first one. Uh, um, factual question: Yes, the beer and barley wine festival is numerous times in the evening center, which is a municipal owned facility. Uh, right now, the assembly has passed the misdemeanor criminal provision. 300 consuming marijuana in a public place. It is unlawful for any person to knowingly consume marijuana when the person is one on, in, or upon any public place except is permitted by ordinance, regulation, statute, or permit. Public place includes, among other things, convention centers. So we'd have to do some tweaking to the law in order to make this work. Um, there is no, there is a distinction in state law between the public consumption of marijuana and regulated consumption of alcohol. And there are public policy reasons why you might distinguish between the two. Um, a certain bit has to smoking, that the public consumption of alcohol doesn't have secondhand smoke kind of effect. Um, but frankly, this is an issue that we didn't really intend at this point to bite off, but it, before acting on making some of these contract provisions more permanent, you want us to take a harder look at it, we can build it. Well, and so I heard on the radio that there was some sort of a trade show over at the Sheraton Hotel a few weeks ago. I didn't go over there, so I don't know about it. So I'm wondering, did they were they did they have people consuming over there? Uh, maybe maybe the police department knows about that. I don't know. Um, and so are, are we going to be setting ourselves up so that we don't get these trade shows at the at our convention centers, and they're going to go and have them at the at the hotels. If we if we're too restrictive on on some of our regulations, so, Chair, we were contacted by the boosters of the Sheraton event. We told them that public consumption in public places is prohibited by both state regulation, state law, and municipal like, regulation. They seem to understand that. They don't know if consumption occurred at their event or not. They didn't attend, but it shouldn't have. Um, I don't know that these contract provisions are materially different from the kind of regulations that a Sheraton would ask someone to comply with, but this would be the assembly acting as sort of the proprietor of their own convention center and saying we want samples to be handled in this way and want to make sure everyone understands the rules of the road. Um, that's the best I can offer you this point. I would tell you one concern I had when I heard that same advertisement. They were giving me a military discount to be to active duty military that aren't attended. Huh. Keep in mind, UCMJ applies to active military people. <laughs> and if they're using marijuana, they're likely to be discharged or gone to the other military. This is my 39 years in the military. Wow. So for, for a place to say, we want the mili active duty military, we'll give you a discount, and setting the active duty mail failure. Well, I think because they, they test positive, they're going to get discharged. You don't do that nonsense. I, I think the convention, if I understood the uh, Enough was they were sort of it was sort of information for someone who was thinking about getting into the business. 
you know, and they would be able to answer some of the questions and have materials available to answer the questions about some of the laws that have been set up by the state by the muni. And, you know, uh, they also had some training uh, sessions set up so you could get, train yourself and maybe get a marijuana control license or permit or whatever it is that you have. Again, to simply because the citizens of Alaska decided marijuana is legal doesn't mean the federal government's going to change their policy on it right yet. I, mean, I, concern, I get concerned when I go to the military meeting and do something about it. To be fair, you probably get a general discharge, not a dishonorable discharge. So you <laughs> Whatever. Tell so, me which one you're going to ask for. Do you want a general or dishonorable? Oh, much uh, rather on a general. Give, we can give you an undesirable, too. <laughs> that keeps some of the benefits. Mr. Flynn, I think we're ready to wrap up here, Mr. Chairman. I, just, I think we are. I would just uh, suggest that if it's uh, the body's interest to do a little more work on this, or at least co contemplate how we might uh, accommodate legal consumption. Um, I'd be happy to take that on on your behalf. If you want to charge forward with this and try and figure it out later, that's an option. I just, Thank you, Mr. I'd rather get it right the first time. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, can I ask a quick question? Yes, sir. Bill, is there some reason why this is, is this, is this time sensitive or that are we seeing these things kind of coming up on the horizon and we need to have this in place? Or can we do a little more work on this Chair, I'm not aware of any proposed convention to the Design Center in the near term. We just had one now maybe a couple months ago. That was the moment where we realized the status of the old resolution was now somewhat ambiguous because the referee were saying these are the rules that are in place until the state has finished its rulemaking. And we don't really have clear direction as to what the contract is supposed to look like now. Um, it's the real answer is I don't know if on the deny number. I don't think we can really immediately need to do this right now, of course. But I do think Mr. Clint's right, we do need to decide what our policy is going to be relative to this. So we'll turn over to Chairman when he gets to that point and let her decide how she wants to proceed. From my perspective, I'd want us to look for the document and start working on the overall policy. Because the assembly's never really decided that we need to. The shake yeah, on, with the shake up on the board, there may be some changes taking place at the state level. What about that? Shake on the board? We worry about us, not them. Anyway, I'm going to end this meeting. Thanks for being here.